these things here? These are the only two electrical outlets in the entire cabin. Oh. None by the bed, nothing. And so I had them bring me in an extension cord for my CPAP machine, and they brought me in this little tiny refrigerator unit for my insulin. But we had to run the wire underneath the bed to get it by me. Nice couch, nice little table. And this is, says the key, it's a form of membership. You pay a little bit extra for it, but uh, you get a nice little fruit basket. You get a wonderful welcome aboard lunch from the steakhouse. Uh, you get the whole cruise. You get the internet. And uh, you have a goodbye breakfast. You get first call for tours. I mean, it's a really nice deal. We didn't do it the first time, but definitely going to do it from now on. And they kept track of us. <coughs> it is. You wore that all the time. You never took it off. And it identifies you by a series of numbers that's only kept in one server. So if you come down with COVID, they can track you where you've been, actually who you've come in contact with, mm. so that they can contact those people and they know exactly who you've come in contact with. Mm. Off the ship, it doesn't work, but on the ship, it does. I have a really nice idea. Everybody liked it. You know, they thought it's really nice of them. Now, it was close to Christmas. They had all kinds of Christmas stuff up, but you know me. <clears throat> we got uh, the menorah up here. This is actually the baby size of the one our Jewish community of the Hill Country had on the um, courthouse lawn. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a six foot one, ours is a 12 foot one. But uh, I thought that was really neat of them to put the menorah up there. Mm -hmm. Now, every night after dinner, we would come home. Our steward, his name was Devlin. He was from India. They were all from India. I mean, it was like going home again. <laughs> but every night when we came in, he had a treat for us. He had a little towel animals. He's got a dinosaur, a snail. Oh, so cute. The Playboy bunny. <laughs> an orangutan. Oh, wow. A frog. <laughs> and the turtle. And most of the time, the other people didn't get them every night. But uh, he liked us, and we liked him. So he, <laughs> he knew we appreciated it. And so a little later on that first day, we set sail, and there we are going out of Galveston. This part of the ship right here, this is the main dining room up here, just absolutely gorgeous. So we were on our way to Rotan. This itty bitty island right here, that's Roatan. Hmm. And 38 miles off the course of Honduras, they have the same government, if you want to call it that. Um, <laughs> these people are dirt poor, just dirt poor. Uh, they have problems getting medical help. Uh, the, some doctors and nurses criticized the government for their ineffective handling of COVID. And so the government fired over 200 doctors and nurses, leaving people without medical care. Nice guys. So here's Roatan coming in. See, it's dark up here. Started to mist. And... There we are. Now, if it's you, a big ship. It's a big thing. Now, <clears> if <throat> you were on the other side, this right there on the other side of the ship, that's where we were. We were on the ninth deck. And so here's Roatan. We come in 
here in Cox and Hole. And this is where we're going up here to Punta Gorda. That's where the Carifuna people is. Uh, Carifuna is a mixture of sub-Saharan West Africa, uh, mainly from Ghana, slaves that were brought into the Caribbean and they made their way to Ruatan in two big exoduses. Well, it was an exodus that was imposed upon them. In the 1600s, the French were in charge. Um, they brought people over from West Africa and they put them to work, basically slaves, and they had them doing such horrible work that they just said, no, we're not going to do it anymore. But they didn't kill them like they would over in this country. They shipped them off to Rotan, where there was already an indigenous population there. In the 1700s, the British were in charge. They brought the slaves over from Ghana. Ghana says, we're not going to do that garbage. They knew about what the French did, so they shipped them over. We're talking thousands and thousands of people uh, herded into small ships like cattle, literally like cattle, and dumped. And most of them were dumped up there in Punta Gorda. That's it. Leave them there. No supplies, nothing. Just there you are. So that's how the current population came about through the intermarriage from the <coughs> Africans with the indigenous people. Actually, they were, they think, part African and part Polynesian. Because the Polynesians, of course, they went everywhere. But it's a lovely, lovely little island. They're very proud that they're not part of the mainland. Everybody there, she says, when they had COVID vaccines and everything available, she says people would be in line for 12 hours or more because everybody wanted it. On the mainland, she said, <clears throat> They couldn't have cared less. But totally different attitude out there. Here's a little part where we were. This line here, the ocean breaking, it's the second largest coral reef in the world, second only to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And as you can see, the clouds are coming in the mist is rain that's coming down. These folks set out handicrafts and things for us, but the rain just came in. This little place here, there is a restaurant that would be off screen. You can go out there, have your meal. And this is what we came for. It was the dancers. Uh, they said that they were going to do a dance that was the dance, they called the dance of the shaman. So we said, okay, let's go. <laughs> and before they, before they started, they had a little stew that was made of coconut milk, fish, and plantain. And, you know, they were coming around and saying, give it to me. Peg and I, and maybe just another one or two. Try it because you know, well, we know we don't know where it comes from. I said, I don't care where it comes from. Oh God, it was good. <laughs> That's wonderful. So there's the dance company. And these folks all have other jobs. And they do this just for for tours. And they use the money uh, for cultural enrichment of their children so that their children don't forget mm. where, who they are. <clears throat> where they came from. There are no musical instruments <clears throat> other than drums, 
two types of drums. This one here has a higher tone than this one. Then they have, uh, it's like, uh, like a maraca, mm -hmm. only you hold it in both hands. And then they had some maracas with handles on them. But uh, it's just rhythm. And the story goes like this. The ladies come out, and it's always the ladies, that they do a purification of the area. And you see the dresses like that. They purposely swing them back and forth. And a little lady, she was 80 years old. She was from uh, Korea. And she saw this, and she started to cry. Mm -hmm. And she says, that's a Korean dance. She says, we have a dance exactly wow. like that. Not the same music, not the same words, but the actions mm -hmm. were the same. And so they would walk around, and it was interesting. They would circle each other. And then when they came out, they both just went Foof, like that out into the open area. And that's getting all the negativity and everything out and preparing for the dance. This fellow, he represents a warrior. And he comes out, he dances over here and then around the area. He's telling evil spirits, I'm here to get you. <laughs> no, don't come, don't try anything. Here's the shaman, interesting, the costume. All of this is the veil between the seen and the unseen. Up here, it looks like a box, but it's an open area. And uh, what it represents is that when the shaman goes into trance, the spirit leaves through the top of the head. And so he dances around, he does, and, uh, he has bells and up here, these little light things. Those are cowrie shells. And cowrie shells are a talisman, a protection. And you may have heard that some islands, they use cowrie shells as uh, oh, currency. God. Yeah, that's why. Mm -hmm because they were a protection. Whoever traded with them received the protection. Very interesting, interesting story. There he's going, he's going on both sides, and he'll come back. And all of this while, while he's here, every now and then his body will shake. And all of these things will quiver. It's, it's, Difficult to understand, to, to explain, but that's him communing with the spirits of the other world. Now he's back here, and he stopped, and that leg just stood up. And that's when he was, suppose the shaman returns to the body, but at that time the warrior comes out to protect him from being possessed by any evil spirits that may be there because coming back into the body they say that's when they're the most vulnerable but very very interesting um, to see that and uh, I talked to one of the well, this lady here and she says we haven't done that in a while but uh, she says it's raining, and so we thought we'd, we thought we'd do something a little more spiritual this time, hoping that maybe, you know, <laughs> the rain would go away. It didn't, unfortunately. It just kept going and going. Ah, there's my girl. Don, quick, did, how did they dance? Did they come off the ground, or was it clear that they, for the most part, take steps? Most, most of it, well, most of it was uh, taking steps. Um, there, there were a few times when they would jump and turn, 
But other than that, no, they were they were on the ground. This is Valeria Welcome. And her last name is Welcome. Um, she was our guide, a sweetheart, just loved her. In this bag, she had all kinds of Native American uh, medicines that when we were on the bus, oh, the bus, it was like a tin can. Oh, God, it was horrible. You know, you'd sit down, and even if you were skinny, half of your butt was hanging out in the... Uh, but she made it worthwhile. She passed around all these herbs, explained, and I just, I just loved it. But their native food is a cassava bread. And it's very simple. They take the root, they'll boil the root, which will extract some of the, it's, it's poisonous if you just eat it raw. They boil it, then they use this wood, it's a piece of wood that just has fine tooth saw blades embedded in it. They'll scrape the cassava into here. Here's some of it right here. This is the lady that makes the bread. Like a tortilla on a comal. Same thing. There's nothing in here. Uh, no extra water. Nothing. The root is moist enough. They put it on there. They cook it. And if you've ever had pita chips, like either baked, baked pita chips, that's what it tastes like. It has just a, a very, very mild flavor, but, uh, well, I guess if you had to, you could make a, make a meal out of it. Pushing and pulling this wood under here is how they control the temperature. We had the same thing in our similar thing in India. And you can get very, very precise temperatures using that. This is beautiful downtown Punta Gorda in the rain. And uh, on the way back, Leo was talking about the people and how expensive things were. And she was talking about this. Uh, she says, oh, she says, you remember this? this uh, supermarket that we passed on the way up here. Well, that's the only one in this area, and it's so expensive. And so people says, can we stop? And she just kind of looked, and she says, well, okay. So there's Eldon's, and uh, nothing really makes it stand out from any small supermarket really around here that you would see. Except the prices, a box of cereal, you know, the small ones that would cost you maybe two and a half to three and a half dollars, cost eight to ten dollars American. Now, they use American currency, but they have their own currency, and that's part of it. Who got Oh! <laughs> there she goes. Be sure you tell them about the security dog. Oh, yeah. That was charming. This guy, the security guy, he would go out. This was a break in the rain, obviously. But he would go out in the rain with an umbrella and hold it for the people getting out of the car and coming in there. Uh, he would walk them out to the car. Uh, I mean, it was, it, it was just really, really nice to see that. He was really taking care of the customers. And also, uh, many of these young women came in cabs. Yeah. Yeah, there's one there. Yeah. Hmm. But she said that most... Most of these things that uh, it wasn't the natives shopping for themselves because they're just too expensive. 
they were shopping for people that they were housekeepers or whatever, shopping for them. So there's their lempira. Uh, one of them is, uh, let's see, how many? One American dollar is equal to 24 of theirs. And each denomination has its own color. But uh, see, they've got the ruins. They've got ruins here. Actually, this is the ruins that we were going to see. This on there. But um, it was a lovely tour, despite being like sardines in a can. Mm -hmm. But uh, the next day, or that evening, rather, we set off for Mahalwal. Don, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I am going to because <clears throat> because they're so poor and the medical help is almost non-existent. Um, they take care of themselves. But tell a story about our guide and how she's looking after her mother. Remember her mother? Yeah, Alzheimer's? yeah. Is that, is that she works her mother has well Alzheimer's and she works. She has some family member that comes in. I think the, the older kids will come in and stay with her. And then every day she comes and she takes care of them. And she says that they have no facilities, nothing. And uh, she says, I don't have a choice but to take care of her. And she says, honestly, she says, all of us here, even if we had those facilities, we wouldn't put our parents in them. He says, that's not right. They took care of us. We take care of them when they need it. And so she could not work. Was... Yeah. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> I mean, scraping to make ends meet. And that's the story with all of them. Sorry. But this is where we were. This is Roatown here. This is where we ended up the next day. Mahawal, where the port is. Here's coming in, and as you can see, it's hazy. It was misty, and I thought, oh, Lord, I'm going to have to walk in the rain to see the ruins, <clears throat> but we didn't. Uh, it stopped shortly after the boat docked, and this is the port. As you can see, it's not hugely developed like a lot, like Cozumel, oh, Lord. That thing's like a city. It has shops, but just a, really a, a few of them. Is that British? No, it's, that's in Mexico. And this guy, he knew where every tour was, what to look for, who to ask for. If you had any question, you asked him, he'd tell you. Mm -hmm. So here we are. Here's the dock, and we went up past the Capitala Junction, which was wild stands all over the place. Pedro Santos, which was a Mayan settlement, and there's Chacchuan, where we're where we're heading. Here's a diagram of it. Is that there are three excavated temples. This one here that they just called 24, and these two up here, Las Facias, which is the Temple of the Moon. The big one down here is Temple of the Sun. And this big plaza here, all of these buildings, all of this in here, they know they exist, but all of these are still underground, are still covered with vegetation. 10% of the place, that's all the veg, that's all the uh, excavation that they've done because really they started in earnest in the early uh, 1990s. It's only been open to the public since 2002. Now here's an aerial view of the same thing. That's the Temple 24. Go down this way, you, that's how you come in. Go on the path, this area right here. Those were those other two temples that I said are still buried. This is the Grand Plaza. Up here is the temples of the moon over on this side, the sun over here. 
come back like this, and this other area that you saw, that's the residential area. All of it's, except for some basement, um, is still all under the undergrowth. Here's a little place where you come in. They have a tiny little restaurant that will serve tacos. They've got some souvenirs. Most important, they have restrooms. <laughs> and it's about an hour trip. So, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a, a bad trip up there. And we went on a really honest-to-God bus that you could kind of stretch out on. <laughs> oh, my God, it was wonderful. <laughs> and, you know, I saw, remember this, okay, this electrical wiring up here. I'm going to get back to that and show you something that nature did. Here's 24, Temple 24, east side, north side, okay? I'm going to take you around it. There's the west. It's an entrance in here that's blocked off, and unfortunately we couldn't go up there. There are pictograms of the transits of the planet Venus. The Mayan at that time, they knew that Venus was a planet. They were the only ones. The Europeans were still calling it a star. They knew, and a lot of their seasonal ceremonies were based not on the sun, not on the moon, but on Venus. This is the south side, you can't get to it, unfortunately. All right. See? Just like was there just like the electrical wiring that was on that building. No, that's a taproot from a tree. Ooh. It's not a vine, it's a taproot. And you'll see lots of things like this. But look at that, it follows. And I asked the guy, you know, did you move move it or somehow hold it in place? He says, no, nature did. So I just thought that was so neat. And here's a look at the different tiers separate, another tier separate, different types of rock. A lot of temples, they're stuccoed on the outside. This one wasn't. It never was, and so this was strictly decoration. And these pyramids, unlike the pyramids in Giza, they are solid. Straight through, there's no chambers in there, anything like that. There's a close-up. You see they got big rocks, medium rocks, tiny rocks. And just like there, poked in there. Now, in here, they did use a form of mortar, but uh, I can't, I was trying to remember today the exact ingredients of it, and I can't remember. It's pulverized rocks, it's dirt, it's grass, and that's how they held the thing together. Here's that path that I told you. And this is where those other two temples that are still buried are. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Why but are they buried? They haven't uncovered them yet. Mother Nature took over. Mother Nature took over. The trees and everything, you'll see. But facing this way, if you do a 45 degree turn to your right, to your left, this is what you'll see. It's the Mayan sacred tree. Yahashke is how they pronounce it in Mayan, uh, it means world tree. The roots connect you with the underworld. The uh, trunk lives with you in the material world. And the upper mm. branches connect you with the celestial world, the world of the gods. Um, this tree is, I don't know, Remember way, way back when, when kapok was used to fill pillows mm. instead of uh, feathers? This is the kapok tree. That's where that fiber came from. Mm. Spikes on it. The tradition was that uh, 
that's to, that the gods put that there to keep the humans from ascending without their permission. Mm -hmm. They'd try to climb up, they'd step on their ouch. <laughs> In reality, it, it prevents a lot of wildlife from coming up and doing the, getting the fruit off of the tree. So the tree more or less protects itself. Now here's one of those temples that I said was still covered. I mean, unless you knew what you were looking for, you'd just say, well, it's a little hill. This is an interesting thing. This part right here, it's called the strangler fig. And it will wrap around a tree. And it actually is a tree, but it starts as a vine. It comes up as it grows. It gets wider and wider. And it's a parasite. Mm -hmm. And it sucks the nutrients and moisture out of the tree, out of the host. And here's yeah. one. You see, there's just nothing there. Hmm. Nothing on the inside. It keeps growing. Wow. And then it sprouts a canopy. And it's a, it's a form of ficus. But they call it strangler fig, and it's the they say the tree that starts as a vine, and it does, and it's amazing. We're coming up now to the steps to the Temple of the Sun, or to the moon, rather. This young man, his name was Brandon, 29 years old, first time out of the country. He was like a kid in a candy store. Sweet, sweet young man. He hung with us for the tour. There's the stairway to the temple of the moon there it is this right here this lean to there are pictographs there that have become lightened by the sunlight and so they've put that there to protect them there's just another couple of views of it beautiful thing This is the stairway to the Temple of the Sun, bigger one. There it is. Sacrificial stones, yes, sir. You can sacrifice four people at once. <laughs> you know, but you look at this, and you look at the beauty of this rounded corners. In Europe at that time, there were no rounded corners. The Mayans came here at, in 200 BC. Look at that. And at the same time in Europe, the Europeans were beating themselves over the head with clubs, living in huts. Savages, they called them. Pretty smart savages. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. <clears throat> now, at the bottom of the stairway up there was the stele. Mm -hmm. 